Alright, we're on the Magon. This tutorial of sorts is full of tips and tricks for how you can play Realm better. It'll be fast paced and there's a lot to get through, so let's get started. When you first hop into the Realm, you end up on the beach. Yeah, that's fine, but where's the beach? What's really in all that black space out there? This here is a map of all the roads in a typical realm. It's a pretty good indication of where everything is. The roads define the boundaries of the regions in the map. The outer road coloured in green is the lowlands. The orange road is through the midlands and the red road edge is the highlands. The cluster of players within the red road are in the godlands. This is important because these areas also define where enemies and events spawn. All the top level quests and events can spawn inside the inner road, although some will occasionally spawn just outside of it. Situated just inside the inner road between highlands and godlands are the ghost kings and cyclops gods, both of which are necessary quests for closing the realm. End ancients lie between the red and orange, and liches are even further out than that, around the orange road. And this is an example map from Aim and P's map generator. The quest marker directs you to the highest level quest that is nearest to you. However, as you move around the map or as new quests spawn, it will not immediately tell you where they are if they are closest. Here, a skull shrine is spawned. To update the quest marker, you can complete the available quest, wait 15 to 20 seconds for an automatic update, or if that is too slow, you can teleport, which will instantly change the marker to the closest quest. Okay, but enough of that. Classes. First up, Knight. Knight's pretty badass. You've got the highest defense of any character in the game, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Here, I'm just running through godlands. When approaching a cube guard, you want to avoid the cluster of little blue cubes that can slow you. Here, I strap across the front of it to evade them, then run straight in once I see the opening to destroy the main cube. Two stuns gives you enough time to kill it with your sword. Stun is a powerful ability that stops enemies from firing back. Here at Lord of the Lost Lands, it allows you and others to deal damage safely. With Demon Blade, I'm using fires two shots, and so it makes a great combo with the stun. With the Lord here, it's just rinse and repeat. No trouble at all here for a knight, although other classes may not have it so easy. Rogue is in many ways the opposite of a knight. It's a very fast class and lightly armoured, and your cloak stops the enemies from firing at you. But don't be fooled into thinking they won't fire at your friends instead. So because of this, rogues often play alone. Although, having two rogues at once often works very well too. The Sphinx here in his last phase won't fire at all and becomes a very easy target. If you get caught out with too many enemies attacking you, you can simply cloak and the pain will stop. And a hermit god use a bone dagger because the minions are so dense. The cloak makes Rogue an excellent class for rushing places like the Ocean Trench, because the enemies simply won't fire at you. At the boss, the playing Walker Cloak lets you quickly hop between the air bubbles and Thessal, maximising efficiency. But being invisible isn't useful here because Thessal's shots are not aimed at anyone. When your screen starts to flash red around the edges, that means you're suffocating and you should probably get out of there. You should hang back for the waves of shots and teleport back in once you're finished. But watch out for the armor break because they really do hurt. They reduce your defense to zero. Now, Archer. The Coral Bow makes you the king of godlands. It fires fast, and pierces, and has a little spread to help you hit more gods. Here, I'm in just a small godlands group, but large godlands trains are the best way to gain fame because the experience gained from the clan god is shared to all other players around the player who got the kill shot. Gods are no trouble at all for you, and you don't even need to use your ability. Here's a sorcerer in a true godlands train. The sorcerer is fast and has good fatality, so therefore is great at dodging and surviving, but its DPS is only slightly higher than a priest's. However, the anti scepter slows the enemies, making them much easier to hit, and thus also a good complement to a godlands train. Moving on fast now, we have the trickster. Your decoy tracks the monster attacks, and so it allows you to attack relatively safely, although not as safe as a rogue would. However, unlike a rogue, all other players can benefit from a well-placed decoy. Placing the decoy behind the cube god allows you to get up close and then dodge any remaining attacks. Here, the decoy attracts the hermit tentacles, making them easier pickings for everyone else. Or you can attract the fire of the hermit, allowing everyone to attack safely. A good trickster in the wine cellar can use the decoy to attract the fire of Oryx, allowing a knight to get a stun in on him. If the knight can get a chain stun, then everyone can attack Oryx in complete safety. Seriously, just look how easy that is. The prism also allows you to teleport to anywhere visible on screen. If you're in trouble at any time, you can safely escape with your prism. And so this makes rushing dungeons a breeze if you have to start a prism on you. Here we are on a priest in a forbidden jungle. The cool thing here is you can get hallucinated. You can get this effect at any time by using a magic mushroom. Laughs guaranteed. The boss of the jungle also drops pollen powder. This neat potion restores MP to everyone around you, so it's quite beneficial to have at a boss fight. When everyone is suddenly able to use their abilities. The priest is pretty much the master of not caring. You can heal yourself, so if you get hurt, you just heal yourself. It's as simple as that, run and shoot. The priest may have a very low DPS, but this doesn't stop it being a hell of a fun class. So here's some more footage of a priest refusing to care. 
Oh, and it's not your duty to heal others, but it's a common courtesy to do so. Plus, your group will be able to kill things much faster if you have others who can fight alongside you. If you happen to get quieted, you can either Nexus or enter a portal before the quiet wears off, and you will instantly get your MB back. The Mystic has a unique stasis ability. Quite simply, if you don't want a monster to be there, then you can remove it temporarily. At the Skull Shrine, this lets you and others get the kill easily. The Auntie at all buffs damage and speed, making you the fastest character, doing a lot of damage, which is great for rushing and getting anywhere quickly. You're so fast you can pass by enemies before they fire at you. If you want to see who is firing over the wall at you, then drop a couple of stasises. Panicking and don't know who's firing at you? And only your MP bar will give you some time. The Necro is another staff user, which, like the priest, has a healing ability. This means that even at a dangerous place like a cube god, you can get away with dodging really badly, because you can simply heal yourself. One key feature of the Necromancer is that there is no limit on how much you can heal, so if you're short on MP, you can delay the heal until you actually need it. Godland's Constructs are an excellent renewable healing resource. And here, at a Pentaract, you kill it by destroying all five towers within 15 seconds. When one tower goes down, the red particles in the air turn yellow, indicating the timer has started. The optimum strategy is to damage all the towers without destroying them, and to only destroy one tower when you're sure you can destroy your five. The EP is a great weapon for killing Pentaract towers quickly. As stated before, the amount you can heal is limited only by the HP of who you're healing. But don't be fooled into thinking you're invincible. With a robot on you are still very squishy. Ghost Kings are easy. All you have to do is kill the Ghost Master, which always spawns to the east of the Ghost King. Drag him down and the kill will be quick. And here again, the EP is an excellent weapon because it deals so much damage. When it comes to doing the castle, you must remember it is a race to get to Ox first. So the best strategy is to run straight in there. At the end of the bridge, it's a bit of an open area which allows you to circle and avoid taking damage. Unfortunately here, I circled too close to the quiet bomb, so I have to back out and avoid its shots. However, backing out has dragged the monsters with me, making it very easy for the rogue to break a hole in the first wall. And if you're lucky, you can get through here without getting quieted. The general theme with doing the castle efficiently is to rush into danger and break the walls down by doing small circles while always firing forwards at the wall. You only need to kill minions if you have to, or if you can't reach the walls. At this last bridge though, the quiet bomb's also a priority. But still, it's simply a matter of dragging and dodging the minions while focusing on the wall. While I'm circling here, I'll say that the Paladin Seal is a versatile team ability because you can both heal friends and make them stronger. And again, the rogue here shows the cloak lets you ignore the minions. When you decide to rush out to the last wall, don't stop along the way and try not to get slowed. I like to kill the minions at the end because it's less of a gamble, but depending on your class, it may just be better to go for the wall. If you're a rogue class, this may not be for you, but everyone else can do this fine, especially if you have a piercing weapon. And unless you have a Cronus, a bone dagger is hands down the best dagger in the castle. When you're at the Guardians, shoot the blue one because he heals faster. And rather than dodging, always try to stand in one of the blind spots of the Stone Guardian sword. Orx is usually fairly straightforward because of the large numbers of people involved in the battle. With experience, you will learn the timings when he goes vulnerable, so you can adjust your attacks to suit. Still, most of the fight is simply dodging and always shooting. And in some cases, you don't even have to dodge. One of the most frustrating phases is this one, where Orx weakens and dazes you. The best strategy is just to circle. When Orx calls out, I am the master of this existence, I like to back out to avoid the spray of quiet shots. While you're backed out, Oryx will stay invulnerable so you don't actually miss out on dealing any damage. I think Oryx does go vulnerable during the second quiet wave, so it's a choice if you want to do more damage or conserve MP for whatever comes next. And that choice is really class dependent, especially if the wine cellar is going to be opened. When it's time for more dancing, it is simply not worth going in the ring with a staff, wand or bow that is not doom, because being weakened will cause you to do single figure damage to Oryx. However, a mister can break into the circle and safely deal damage unweakened. In this final phase, Oryx is always vulnerable and armoured, giving it 120 defence. Here, a slow, paralyzed or stun is useful to make him easier to hit. Depending on who's left, this phase can go extremely quickly, or even be skipped completely. The best tactic with Oryx in the wine cellar is to never run directly at him. Always circle in a clockwise direction. Clockwise, because if you get confused, it will cause you to run away from Oryx. Assassin is the safest class, and just one top tier poison will do enough damage to get soulbound. Oryx's stars each deal a lot of damage. Even as a priest using all of my MP, I barely escape. But enough of the wine cellar. Lag is the biggest problem you'll have there, and I can't help you with that. So this is a tomb. The most efficient way to do the tomb is to have someone rush to the sarks, so that you don't have to fight all the mobs along the way. With its cloak, the rogue is exceptional at this.
Many other classes can also rush competently, such as the knight. Here, the only thing you need to do is avoid getting paralysed or armour broken. You can tank all the usual damage and stun if you're in trouble. It's best to use your map to decide where to run. You barely need to look at your character unless there are towers. Most enemies can be identified by their appearance on the map. Warriors are also good at rushing. It's your choice to use either the helm with a speed boost or the one that armors you. I prefer the jug because if I get in trouble, I can usually just power through it. Because I love Mystic, I just had to show that they can rush too, even if there is such a small margin of error when you try. Also, because of their speed, the other data classes of Assassin and Trickster can also rush just fine, but the teleport of the Trickster makes it far better for getting out of trouble. You need to destroy all the Sarks in order to attack the Immortals. Attacking them causes them to activate and start trying to kill you. This is absolutely key. If you do not shoot them, they will not fire at you. Of the three mortals, Bess is the easiest to kill first. He doesn't paralyse and his artefacts are far less intrusive than Nuts or Gibbs. So to have a safe and easy tomb, you have to make sure your entire group knows the plan and that they all take care not to attack the other immortals until it is time to do so. Of course, such cooperation is not always possible, and most public tombs end up descending into a free-for-all, where everyone attacks everything. This is much harder to deal with, but also much more fun and rewarding. Certain classes can be very useful when attacking the bosses. Mystic can stasis the immortals to keep them from progressing into their later phases. Priests can purify to remove a weak, slow, armor break and paralyze. In that last phase, she will suddenly charge at you. Not even a purify will always save you from the swarm of paralyzing shots. However, if you can manage to stun her before she rages at you, the kill will be quick and easy. Gibbs the hardest of the three immortals, and so is usually left until last. His shots do the highest damage, and in his later phases he will repeatedly send out paralyzed scarabs and annoyingly high damage artifacts. In his last phase, he will jump away from you at high speed, so the strategy is to either push him to a wall or surround him. But if you have a rogue, it is best for everyone else to back out and let the rogue get the kill safely. Now, there are some remaining classes that I haven't mentioned. Warrior is a very fun class. You have a little less defense than a knight, but can instead deal a lot more damage with your high attack stats. A juggernaut helm will also protect you very well, unless you do some crazy shit while boosted. Circling the skull shrine is the best way to dodge while still dealing a lot of damage. However, other classes may not want to get so close. The main skull has about the same rate of fire as a slime god, so if you've learned how to force a slime god to fire away from you, then just apply that same rhythm to the skull shrine. Of course, it's not that simple, because little red skulls will kill you if you're not careful. And after killing the skull, the warrior doesn't even have to wait before killing the pentagrag that happens to be around it. Assassin has a different way of doing skulls. If you can throw two poisons, you will kill every little skull that you hit. This will get you soul bound and makes it much easier for you and others to kill the main skull. And last but not least, the Huntress. As shown by the legends, it is a ubiquitous, fate farming machine. Just like the archer, the bow makes you excellent in godlands. And despite the high MP cost of the traps, the usefulness lies in the fact that you can easily hit multiple enemies, and the trap stays active on the ground if you happen to miss. Unsurprisingly, the Huntress is also good against spiders. One final word of advice. If you want to learn how to dodge, play a melee character. If you can learn how to dodge enemies from just a couple of squares away, all other classes will seem easy in comparison. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. Do subscribe and check out some of my other videos. If you want to see a follow-up video that's more in-depth, then feel free to comment on what you'd like to see. Ciao.